Hello. Hello, Professor Sir. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Thank you for joining. Great nice to see you again. I'm sorry I was in my car when you called. Oh, yeah. Sorry for this. <laughs> my uh, internet connection is too slow at home, so I moved to the, the university. Oh, sorry. And for it's that. very early. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have live streaming on YouTube as well and okay. on the Surgical TV channel with yes. Dr. Okay. John Bennett. Oh. Here is your... Professor Sapiano. Hello. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. How are you, Albert? Yeah. Thank you very much for, for uh, uh, take our invitation. Very important for us uh, because your uh, lectures is a key, key lecture now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> for, for surgeons, for understanding uh, the okay. anatomy. Very important, very important. So we, uh, Borba come to me one month before and we work in my lab and uh, now I have exoscope, you know, exoscope. You know what? Exoscope. No, what, what is that? Uh, this is not microscope, this is another tool. Now, new one. Yes, I don't, I don't see what it is, no. Yeah, I show you maybe later, maybe I show you. Yes. And now we have some project, maybe you also maybe connect for us uh, just for this new tool, anatomic dissection, anatomy, exoscopic anatomy, 3D, 3D, a few small, small, small device uh, in 3D. Oh, it's like a camera or? Out, out, but, but, but it's, very, it's very movable, movable. Okay, okay, I see, okay. Yeah, exoscope. exoscope. Yeah. So, uh, and we sit down and we work together two weeks and when we decide, uh, uh, Federal Center of Neurosurgery have uh, a lot of experience, a lot of friends, very pro prominent uh, in the world, anatomists, uh, surgeons. So why we uh, decide to organize some webinar series? Okay. Yeah, about uh, for for young, mainly for young residents. Okay, no, that's good. Okay, that, that was my, uh, my so our experience, our life surgery, our dissections, uh, our lab, our friends, our brothers, it's all together, all together to to create some. High level, high level webinars about the four residents. Mainly. Okay. Yeah. Good. So Thank I, you for inviting me anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, you are maybe key, key person because anatomy is the most important, most important. Yeah. So like this, this is idea. This is idea. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is the first seminar. This is the first seminar. Oh, it's the first one. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting to to connect to you more, more, more deeply, more deeply. Okay. Yeah, maybe send, maybe your guys come to our place and maybe you come, maybe our guys to you, maybe, maybe next year you'll be easy from COVID. I don't I know. I hope it will be finally easier. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe easy. So I also, um, for me, very interesting um, project about the white matter dissection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because uh, we have a lot of epilepsy surgery now. Yes, I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in child and in others, uh, in adults. So, why my dissection is very important. So maybe also you help us for this kind of research. Okay. And for publication, and publication now is very important. No, I, I agree. Yeah. As you know, I, I told you I was really um, impressed by the the quality of the dissection of your guys. I don't remember the, his name. Yeah. The guy who was working in the lab full time, yeah. and, and we uh, must combine, and we must combine, combine for the publication. Very nice, yes. Okay. 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 Okay, Christoph. So I, I will maybe leave quite early after the, my uh, my talk. Of course, no problem. Yeah, just, many, just, many just, things to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Just so, a lecture. Just a lecture. Okay. 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 I will try to find my file. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Let me find my start. presentation. <laughs> yeah, just take your time. Maybe you can turn off the video for a while to feel comfortable because now we're having a live stream on YouTube as well. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> at what time yeah. are we beginning? We're being at. Uh, yeah, at a couple of a couple of minutes. Okay, so okay, so I can as, turn off the. As soon as you're ready, just turn on okay. the video and we'll get connected. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. I will just find my presentation.
Hello, good morning. Ух ты, ё-моё. Ну, я скажу что-нибудь. О, Hello, how are you, how are you, Luis? Good, good, good. Что-то не слышно. You, you cut your hair? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'm a young guy. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> what's happening? What's happening? Young girlfriend. Young girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Very good. How are you? Fine. We, we we are fine. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Lot of work. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in Spain now. Ah, in Spain. Oh. Yeah, little yeah, bit yeah. ill. Little bit ill. No. Yeah. Uh, now it's six o'clock in the morning here. Oh, I, came, yeah. I came to my wife to stay 10 days here as a vacation. Oh, oh. Very nice place, very nice place. Yeah. Which place? Which city? Now I'm in Sevilla. Sevilla. Mm. Sevilla. Sevilla. Mm. Yeah, in the south. Yeah. Yeah. And the hotel here, I don't know if you can actually be okay, but we are ready. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, Christopher is here? Christopher is here, yeah. Yeah. Oh, IP? Uh, IP. IP, yeah, IP. Okay, we wait IP now. Ah, okay. Well, he is in, he's in another city. There is a meeting, you know? Yeah, maybe. In airport now, IP in airport now. Ah, airport. Airport, ah. he's he just uh, moving. Ah, okay, good, good. Here, so, but he uh, promised us to connect. Okay, and can can we organize to May to May the the double uh, World Federation meeting in? You mean? In, in to me? Yeah, I think it's possible, but it depends from COVID situation. Yeah, what has happened now today? It's, now it's again it's worse. worse. Now it's again worse. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I don't know. But it's completely crazy worse now. When you go to the home, and maybe one month it's okay, but now it's completely worse. Yeah. yeah. A lot of cases again. Yeah, a lot of cases again. A lot of Smith that this deaths, a lot of deaths also. Yeah. So it, it depends from the COVID situation. I think maybe next ne, uh, next year may be easy and possible to organize. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, to May. May. To May will be okay. Spring, spring. Spring, I think it's possible. Yeah. May is it spring? Spring. May is it spring? Uh, yeah, May spring, yeah. March, May, like this. Yeah. June. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. So it's, Unbelievable. It's, it's possible. It's honor for us. Honor for us. Honor yeah. for us. But the people is not vaccinated? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, the government pushed to vaccinate, push very strongly pushed. Yeah. So in my hospital now, all, all staff uh, vaccinate. Mm -hmm. Completely, one hundred percent. Yeah, great. Like it. Good. Good. But yeah. new case in your, uh, in the people that was vaccinated or not? Uh, yeah, not, people all people, not, not all people want to vaccinate. Not all people. Mm -hmm. Not all people. So, not belief to vaccine, <laughs> as I understood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not easy, my friend. Not easy. Yeah. In, Sp in Spain, what situation in Spain now? It's under control. In, in Brazil, it's much, much better. Mm. Much Good. better, much better. Good. Now I have few cases. Mm. Few cases. Good. Yeah. You are very, you are very interesting uh, look, looking now. <laughs> Like a <laughs> like a sportsman, <laughs> like a young guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Very nice looking. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
okay. uh, yeah. uh, what about our video video cases uh, you have we prepare for the guy is working that case okay but okay. it's a little bit difficult uh, i need the contact that guy remember the guy that they were doing the the work the, the epilepsy guy the guy with ah, epilepsy okay, yeah i send you what do you want send you want yeah what is his contact to see what he can he can do to work in that, that video the paperwork the only one will be accepted yeah world world research maybe maybe but mars you must to, to write the answer to review. No, but there i think now when they accept the first time they i will accept it should be okay okay interesting should be okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay Luis, uh, I from I have no reply, uh, but we have video of, of, of I lecture. Uh, okay. So uh, it's okay. possible to start now, and uh, we just uh, uh, start uh, with I video if necessary, if not connection. Uh, okay, uh, they are recording already? They are recording? Yeah, yeah, recording, no problem. Hello, Christoph. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? All right, fine. Six o'clock in the morning? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah. Ah, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, Maybe we, we, we start. You say some words. Yeah, I can, okay. can say some words, and, and Christoph can talk. And okay. after that. I, okay. I can talk, you can talk. Okay, okay. Good day for all participants, uh, for all lecturers. Uh, uh, today is very important even for us, for uh, our friends, for our Federal Center of Neurosurgery. Because we, today we start a new project uh, in our life, in life of our Federal Center of Neurosurgery, and I hope in the life of the uh, neurosurgery of all the world. Uh, I have a lot of friends, and one of my, my big friends is Luis Borba, and, and when we study in my place, in our lab, in our Federal Center of Neurosurgery, we see a lot of cases. We uh, did uh, have a, a lot of the dissection of new tools, for example, like exoscope. And we have a, a new idea. And uh, my friend and my brother, Luis Borba, pushed me to organize uh, some uh, webinars, uh, especially for the young uh, for the young residents, just to share <laughs> our experience with what we have a lot inside of the, not only a federal center of neurosurgery, but from the uh, world neurosurgery uh, about, uh, about some uh, uh, hot topics in in uh, in neurosurgery mainly important for uh, for the life residents life in 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 daily life uh, of uh, residents and young uh, neurosurgeons so why we create now uh, the uh, series of the webinars of actual topic in neurosurgery it include uh, uh, topics uh, mainly uh, mainly now for the adults uh, neurosurgeons, but some topics will be uh, used very useful for the also pediatric neurosurgeons. So we combine topics together. Uh, today, today we uh, will uh, we, we decide to, uh, to open our webinars from the cavernous sinus because cavernous sinus is the uh, most important key for the very difficult regions uh, in the neurosurgery. So it's uh, very important. Uh, know how how to operate in this file, and uh, we include uh, some very renowned in in the world uh, uh, surgeons. Uh, these surgeons have a lot of experience in this field of the surgery, like uh, Professor Borba. Uh, we in inc include and invite as, as a very famous anatomist like Christopher Bistro from France, and uh, I, 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 our also very uh, famous. Uh, skull-based neurosurgeon, I have Cherian, just to start our uh, first uh, webinars about the cavernous sinus. 
So why it's possible to start and the, the first lectures is uh, the anatomy of the pituitary, pituitary gland and the structures, anatomical structures around the pituitary gland. Uh, just to our uh, friends, the uh, anatomist, uh, Christoph Bistro. Uh, Christoph, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me, Albert right. and, and Louis. Um, so I'll try to deal with the Zoom stuff as usual. Uh, oh, what is that, Safari? PowerPoint. Uh, okay, maybe. Okay, maybe Louis also saying some words <laughs> before Christoph just finds the file. Louis. Uh, just to say, yeah, just to say okay. good morning. Yeah. It's a good. It's a new project from the Federal Center. Every month you have one one webinar about one topic. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you of all your team and all the team from, from Asia, okay? Every month you have this time to meet here by Zoom. You hope soon you can do this personally, yeah. okay? And, okay, and, and yeah, and this is not only and, oh, our, yeah, yeah. And this is not only a project of our Federal Center of Neurosurgery, our friends, but this is a now project of the uh, WFNS because uh, Louis Borba now is the chief of the educational committee. Congratulations, Louis. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Christoph uh, is ready. Christoph, ready? I can you see the um, can you see the, the screen or not? Yeah, 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 yeah can. can you see the slides? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, my uh, my talk my talk today will be about the, the anatomy of the the pericellar spaces. You will see that it's quite a complicated area, and uh, to understand this anatomy, you first need to know the anatomy of the dura, which is probably the key to understand the anatomy of these uh, pericellar spaces. The first thing you have to realize is that the cranial dura matter is made of two layers. One is the, the outer layer, which is green here, and the other one is the inner layer. And uh, these two layers are, are really the key to understand these, uh, these anatomy. Actually, if you look uh, a schematic drawing of the skull, which is uh, quite oblique, you see that the, the, the outer layer, the osteoperiosteal layer, is lining the bone. It's lining the bone inside the, inside the skull, but also outside the skull, meaning here, these, inner, these outer layer of dura matter is continued by the periosteum in the orbit, and it is here continued by the, the periost uh, in, the, in the spine. The second layer is the inner layer, which is red here. And this layer is lining the previous one. And it is continued here by the, up, the, 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 the sheath of the optic nerve. And here it is continued by the dural bag in the spine. Between these two layers, sometimes there's nothing. It's a virtual space. But sometimes there's a real space. And when there is a real space, it is filled with veins or venous uh, blood plus fat. This is the case here for the cavernous sinus. This is the case for the epidural, uh, the, for the intracranial sinuses. But this is also the case for the orbit. You know that the orbit uh, contains fat plus veins, and uh, it is located between the, the outer layer and the inner layer, which are the continuation of the previous one. And here, this is the case in the epidural area because I told you that the dural bag can, is made of inner layer and the periosteum is made of outer layer. And in between, you know that there is some fat and there are some veins. The important thing to remember is that the dura is organized around two petroclinoid folds. This is a superior view of a skull. This is the anterior direction. The midline is there. This is the right hand side, the posterior uh, direction. This is from magnum as you can see, and this is the, the, the petrous bone. The petroclinoid fold insert, as you know, on the clinoid processes. The first one, which is the anterior clinoid process, inserts on the anterior, petro, anterior clinoid process. And the second one, the, the posterior petroclinoid fold, inserts on the posterior uh, clinoid process. These two folds <coughs> are crossing, and they are making a kind of a hicks like that, and we'll detail them. 
The Ontario petrochloride fold, as I told you, inserts on the Ontario petrochloride process and goes posteriorly, and it is quite sagittal, and it will be curved posteriorly, and it will be actually the, the free edge of the centaurium, as you know. Then the posterior petrochloride fold corresponds to the insertion of the, the tantorium at the superomedial edge of the petrous bones, of the petrous bone, which is located there. So you see that these two petroclinoid folds are dividing the area in four sectors. And these four sectors will be very important to, to, to divide the area. So I propose you to begin by the, this sector, which is the anteromedial sector, which contains the cavernous sinuses and the hypophyseal fossa. And then we'll move to the other one afterwards. So if you perform a slice, a virtual slice like that, this is what you can imagine. This is just, a, this is just this is not real anatomy. This is just a way for you to understand the way it is organized. So this is a coronal slice. You see here the, the, the skull base, the midline would be, would be there. And the skull base is covered by the outer layer, the periostom actually. Then you can recognize here and there the anterior petrochloride folds. And between both anterior petrochloride folds, there is the inner layer, which is a continuous, almost horizontal layer. Then lateral to the anterior petrochloride fold, this layer changes its direction, becomes vertical, and it is actually the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, as we'll see in a moment. And finally, both, uh, both layers of dura mater are attached together underneath the, uh, the temporal uh, lobe, and they form the infratemporal dura. This space is filled with venous blood, and it contains several elements. First, it contains uh, both intracavenous carotid arteries, and then it contains the hypophysis. In this, uh, this animation is not embryology, so it's a way for you to understand the way the dura is organized around the, um, around the, the pituitary gland. Uh, you see that actually these, uh, this pituitary gland is surrounded by a bag, and this bag is just an expansion of the inner layer of the dura mater. So you see that the, the limit between the, the, the pituitary gland and the cavernous sinus is not straight, it just follows the shape of the pituitary gland, and we'll see in a moment that this shape can be very different. So since on the midline you have the pituitary gland, there will be uh, two compartments, two lateral compartments, which are named the cavernous sinuses, uh, or lateral cellar compartments. And between both cavernous sinuses, there is the coronary or intercavernous sinuses, and you will see that there are several of them that gives the communication between both cavernous sinuses. Oh. Okay, so let's begin to have a look to this area, to this horizontal area, which lines the superior aspect of this uh, big space. Uh, so this is a superior view. This is the midline. You recognize the hypothesis here. This is the lateral uh, right, actually, uh, inside. This is the posterior direction. Uh, you recognize here, the first thing you recognize is the anterior petrochloride fold. And then there is the posterior petrochloride fold. And you see that in between, there is the tantorium. Actually, here, the tantorium is retracted, just to show you uh, what is located underneath, that is to say the fifth cranial nerve, we'll come to that in a moment, and the fourth cranial nerve. You see that the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve, enters <clears throat> the roof of the cavernous sinus at the, the very close to the cross, the crossing, sorry, of both petroclinoid folds. Anterior to that, in a small depression, you will find the entering point of the third uh, cranial nerve, the colomotor nerve, and then, of course, there will be another uh, foramen for the ICA, which becomes supracavenous. So this part is the roof of the cavernous sinus. And here you will have uh, the diaphragma cellae. You see that there is no clear limit between the diaphragma cellae and the cavernous sinus. It's just the same continuous layer. <coughs> and in the middle, in the midline, there is a hole 
uh, which is a PS for the uh, hypophysial stroke. There are several triangles. We'll see uh, some of them in the, in, during the talk. One is called the oculomotor triangle. It is running from the ACP to the PCP and then follows both, both uh, petroclinoid folds to, to give this triangle, which corresponds actually to the entry area, the depressed entry area of the third cranial nerve. I told you that there is a foramen for the ICA and the organization of the dura around the ICA is quite complicated because of these two layers. If you consider first the inner layer, the, the one which is uh, depicted in red here, this layer is the one you see when you open the skull. And you see that this layer covers the ACP and it goes medially above the, the optic nerve and it forms a very thin area, which is called the falciform process. And you know that the falciform process is the roof of the posterior part of the, uh, the optic canal. And here there is usually no bone. And if you coagulate this area, then you will coagulate the optic nerve. So beware not to coagulate in this area. And then you see that these, uh, these dura, this inner layer continues up to the jugum. Posteriorly, posterior medially, it goes down around the high CA and it will encircle the high CA to uh, form the upper ring, which is uh, lemiting the, the, the cavernous sinus superiorly. And posteriorly, of course, it is continued by the anterior petroclinoid fold that we saw in a moment ago. So this is um, just a drawing. You have to imagine we removed, we drilled here the ACP. This is the optic strut, which is the attachment point of the ACP to the one of the attachment point of the ACP to the, the body of the sphenoid bone. And you see that the inner layer, which is there, goes down and goes around the, uh, the, the, the ICA and makes just a ring around that. This is called upper ring or inner ring uh, of the ICA. This is quite easy. The, the, the other one is more complicated. This is the inner ring. If you continue the section, you will here remove the ACP. <clears throat> we just kept the dura in place. The optic strut was cut. If you look here, you see this is a posterior view. This is the midline. This is the right inside, the superior direction here. This is the ACP, which is pointing towards us. This is the optic canal. And you see that the ACP is attached to the, the, the body of the sphenoid by two, uh, two roots one anterior root and one posterior root, and the posterior root is called the optic strut. So the optic strut is this small area between the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. So if we remove this area, this is what you can see. This is the, the, the place where the ACP was located. This is the optic strut, which is there. And of course, here you will find the inner layer because the inner layer covers uh, the bone. And you see that the inner layer is going down, it's going down and medial, and it will go around uh, the, um, the, in, the internal carotid artery. It's maybe more obvious here. You have the, the place where the ACP was located, and you see that the inner layer just covers part of the lateral aspect of the, the ICA and makes actually here the, uh, the, the proximal ring or lower ring, which is there. And in between here, there is a collar, there is a small area covered by dura mater, which is uh, larger lat laterally, very small medially. And this collar just encircles the um, ICA and it corresponds actually to the C5 segment of the ICA or clinoid segment, which is located here, very close to uh, the uh, ACP. So it's quite, I think it's very important to understand this, uh, this space. Um, so we'll now focus on the, on the hypophysis, uh, the pituitary gland. This is a, a fetus, a five month fetus. Uh, you see that the roof of the cavernous sinus was open. You see 
the ICA, both ICA, this is the ophthalmic artery, which is very large in the fetus. And you see that in this fetus, the, the pituitary foramen is very large. It's very large because actually it will uh, close during the development. And you see that there's a hook here, which is located between the inner layer, which is continued by the hypophyseal bag, and the outer layer, which is covering the roof of the sphenoid uh, sinus, which is uh, underneath, or sphenoid bone in the fetus. So okay. this is the adult. Um, you, this is a superior view. We are looking from here. Uh, we removed these horizontal layer. That is to say, we removed the roof of the cavernous sinus and the uh, diaphragma cellae. And this is what you can see. This is the midline. Here you can see the pituitary stalk, <clears throat> which is located above the hypophysis. And you see that the hypophysis is not regular at all. There is the posterior lobe and the anterior lobe. And you see, you see that the shape is not round at all. It's sometimes with very with many, many bumps. Lateral to that, oh, sorry, lateral to that, you will find both ICAs with the posterior band, the horizontal segment and the supraclinoid segment of the ICA. The optic, uh, optic nerves and uh, chiasma were attracted anteriorly to show this area. And uh, this is the clivus here. And you see that the ICA are covered <coughs> with a lot of veins. We'll come back to the organization of these veins in, uh, in a moment. If you continue the dissection, if you remove part of the bag, you enter the, the hypophyseal bag and you remove the, the pituitary gland, this is what you can see. You see this bag, which is made of the inner layer of the dura mater. It was connected here to uh, the diaphragma cellae. And this bag is here empty. And if we cut a small, uh, a small window in the bottom of the bag, you see the coronary sinuses, which are connecting both cavernous sinuses. So there is a, a coronary sinus here. There's another one here. We'll see in a moment that it's a quite complicated organization. In this slide, in the next slide, we will look from here. We'll look from the right hand side. So <clears throat> this is the superior direction. This is the anterior direction, the inferior direction. And we removed the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And uh, you see the posterior band of the ICA. This was here the horizontal segment that was cut just to see, to see what's, uh, what's going medially. So here you have the roof of the senoil sinus, which is covered by the outer dura mater. And here there is a remnant of the diaphragma cellae, which is made of inner uh, dura mater. And from there, you will have the bag, the, the hypophyseal bag, and you, you see how irregular is the, uh, the hypophysis. It is not a small ball, it is sometimes shown on, on books. And you see that there are some trabeculations between the inner layer made, uh, which is making the, the bag and the outer layer. And you have, there, you have many trabeculation and in between there are some holes and these holes correspond to the coronary sinuses, which are uncircled, uncircling the uh, hypothesis. If we now move to the posterior direction, we remove the clivus and we see from, uh, from uh, posterior, this is the right direction, the left direction, the superior direction, the inferior direction. And you recognize here the, the, the roof of the cavernous sinus, which is continued by the, the, the diaphragma cellae, and then the roof of the cavernous sinus again. <coughs> Attached to uh, the diaphragma cellae, you will have the bag of the hypophysis, which is here open, we remove part of the gland, and you see that uh, the gland has more or less uh, close contacts to the ICA. Here, between the horizontal segment of the ICA and the gland, there is a quite a wide space, which is normally filled with blood and fat. We removed this element to show you this distance. Here you see that the distance is uh, smaller, but sometimes it's, it's more uh, 
it is smaller. Uh, it is very, very narrow. I mean, uh, here you see that the hypothesis and hypothesal bag are attached to the ICA here and there. And sometimes you can have more complex situation where you see the hypothesis going above the ICA. So it is very important to know that because it means that sometimes, if, for instance, if there is an adenoma developing here, it could mimic uh, an invasion of the cavernous sinus, which is not the case. It's just an adenoma developed on the lateral expansion of the, uh, of the hypothesis. And it is not uh, rare at all because we showed that it exists in about uh, one case out of three. If we now move to uh, the posterior medial quadrant, the posterior medial, median, uh, medial quadrant corresponds to the clivus and another important venous space, which is called the petroclival confluence or dolorous canal. So this is a superior view. This is the midline. You recognize the pituitary stalk, which is uh, uh, retracted anteriorly. You recognize here the clivus. You see the third cranial nerve. You see the fifth cranial, the fifth cranial nerve, sorry, and the sixth cranial nerve. What is uh, striking when you see that is that everything is blue. It means that there is space. There is a space between both layers of dura mater, and this uh, space is filled with venous uh, blood. So we will. Uh, focus in this area around the sixth cranial nerve. And if you cut a small window around the entry point of the sixth cranial nerve, you will see some blood here. And this blood is located between the inner layer, which you can see here, and the outer layer, which you can see uh, here and which covers uh, the, uh, the bone of the area. If you continue the dissection, this is what you can see. We kept this small piece of dura just for you to have a landmark. And you see that there's, there is a very, very rich venous environment. And uh, it explains you why, you why when you are drilling in this area, it may uh, bleed a lot. Uh, and it is actually a, a real confluence. I call that the petroclival venous confluence, which is located here. And it is actually the confluence between the posterior part of the cavernous sinus that we described a moment ago the basal sinus or plexus of the clivus and the inferior petrosal sinus. And everything is going, is, is uh, crossing in this petroclival venous confluence. The other thing I can say, you can see here that it is, uh, it is shown by these two, these two arrows. There are some small trabeculations and these trabeculations are running from the inner layer to the outer layer, which is there. And there are many trabeculations in this uh, um, in this area. It was exactly the same thing in the cavernous sinus. You have a lot of trabeculations like that. If you continue the dissection, oh sorry, I'm sorry, I have a mouse which is a kind of crazy. It's a crazy mouse. Uh, this is a superior view. Uh, you recognize the sixth cranial nerve, the basal plexus of the clivus. Uh, the cavernous sinus, this is the third cranial nerve, the anterior petroclinoid fold, this is the right specimen. And you see that the sixth cranial nerve is running like that, usually underneath, sometimes above, but usually underneath a larger trabeculation, which is called the petroclival, lig petroclival ligament of Gruber. And but this petroclival ligament is just a large trabeculation joining the inner and the outer layers. If you continue the dissection, if you cut the petroclival uh, ligament, and if you, you, you see that the, the sixth cranial nerve is surrounded by, uh, by dura mater, it's surrounded by a uh, sheath of dura mater, we'll see uh, in the drawing in a moment how it is organized. And here you will have a layer of dura mater and then a layer of, of arachnoid. And progressively, these two layers will fuse and more anteriorly, it will just become a peripheral uh, type uh, layer around the sixth cranial nerve. Actually here, you see that the sixth cranial nerve has a very, uh, very strong relationships with the, the, the petrous bone, with the apex of the petrous bone, explaining why when there is a, a tumor in the area or in an inflammatory process, you can have a palsy of this nerve. 
So to make the, 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 the description clearer, let's imagine you, you make uh, an oblique uh, slice like that, just at the level of the apex of the petrous bond, just at the level of this petroclival confluence. This is what you can see. This is the clivus, this is the apex of the petrous bone, and this is the high CA with its posterior band. You see that the clivus and the apex of the petrous bone is covered by the outer layer. This is always the osteoperosal layer. This is always the same story. Then you have the inner layer, which is covering the clivus like that and belongs finally to the roof of the cavernous sinus. Of course, in between, there is an interdural space. This is always the same thing. And this interdural space is filled with veins. <clears throat> these veins, this venous space has different names depending on the location. Here, you can call it the lateral cellar compartment of cavernous sinus. Here, it is called the petroclival venous confluence, the Rolos canal. And then, this is the basal or plexus of the clivus and the inferior petrosal sinus. Here you have the arachnoid, which is lining the inner layer and limits the subarachnoid space. And when the thick cranial nerve, the abducent nerve, enters this space, it will run like that and it will be embedded in a dura mater and arachnoid sheath, which is kind of an evagination of these uh, outer layer, inner layer of dura mater plus arachnoid. And these two layers will follow the six cranial nerve for a while before become, becoming a peripheral type uh, nerve sheath. It was described, so some arachnoid villes, villosity, sorry, were described in the area, meaning that you have some scrutiny of the arachnoid space within these venous uh, space. And it's important for resorption of the CSF, exactly as this is the case along the, the superior sagittal sinus. But it may be also the origin of the meningiomas, because you know that the meningiomas are usually developing from remnants of the acnoid cells included in the, in the dura. So it may explain why this area has a lot of, uh, not a lot, but can have some meningiomas. The content is also very interesting. <coughs> As I told you, uh, when you look at the lateral cellar space, you have islands of fats, a lot of fat that I removed for the previous dissections. And be, ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, there are some uh, islands of fat. And between these islands of fat, there are some splits which uh, contain venous, uh, venous uh, blood. And actually, those splits are very thin border with endothelium. It's, there, is, there are no muscles, it's just, uh, just covered with endothelium. So we could call this area plexiform, which uh, when you dissect and we remove the fat, you see a, a network of, of veins. If you go more posteriorly, especially in the basal plexus of the clivus, there are many trabeculations, I told you, between the inner layer and the outer layer. One of those big trabeculations is the, the ligament of Gruber, the petroclival ligament. And uh, these uh, trabeculations are covered with endothelium. And we, call, we could call that a cavernous-like type. And it seems that uh, the, the, the limit between the cavernous organization and the plexiform organization varies from subject to subject. Maybe because of the age, we don't know exactly why, but some people have a kind of a plexiform organization of the cavernous sinus. Some of the people have a cavernous uh, organization, even in the, uh, in the cavernous sinus. So you see this limit can move more anteriorly and um, it may explain why there are many different descriptions of the anatomy of the cavernous sinus in the different books. If we now move to the posterior lateral quadrant, this is the tantorium, it will be very short. <clears throat> you see uh, that uh, the tantorium, which is here on this drawing, is made of two layers of dura mater, two, two folds of dura mater. And it is made of two folds of inner dura mater. This is the outer dura mater, which is covering the bone. This is the inner layer, which goes like that and then go back. 
And here, it, these two layers are making the uh, tantorium. And between both layers, both inner layers and the outer layer, there's a space called the superior petrosal sinus, which is running along the free edge of the, uh, of the tantorium. And posteriorly, it is continued by the transverse sinus uh, along the occipital bone. As you can see here, you have the superior petrosal sinus at the junction between the petros bone and the tantorium. And you will have here the transverse sinus between the tantorium and the occipital bone. It makes actually the circumtantorial sinuses, which are located around the, uh, the tantorium. If we now move to the middle cerebral fossa and the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, this is what you can see. The first thing you have to understand is that the cavum trigeminale is just like a three finger pouch, three finger uh, glove, which is containing the first ophthalmic, second uh, maxillary, and third mandibular nerves, which are three divisions of the trigeminal uh, nerve. And these, um, this pouch is actually an evagination of the inner layer of the dura mater. It's exactly the same story as it was the case around the six cranial nerve. So there is an evagination around this nerve. And you see that this pouch is located between the inner layer, which is forming the, 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 the layer of the you see when you open the skull, and the outer layer, which is covering the bone. It's located in between. We'll see that in the dissection here. So this is a superior view, midline, right inside, anterior direction. You recognize the big, uh, the big elements as we, we described previously, the posterior petroclinoid fold, the anterior petroclinoid fold. And <clears throat> what is important to see, remember that the, the, the fourth cranial nerve was entering the roof of the cavernous sinus close to the, uh, the crossing of the posterior and anterior petroclinoid fold. Here, the anterior petroclinoid fold was cut, and you see that the, uh, the fourth cranial nerve follows the anterior petroclinoid fold for a while. So it means that if you cut the anterior petroclinoid fold, you have to be very careful because you may uh, cut the fourth cranial nerve, which is located just underneath. This is the roof of the cavernous sinus. And we, if we open the posterior part of the roof of the cavernous sinus, you see some blood which corresponds to the petroclival venous confluence, which is around the sixth cranial nerve, which is there. You recognize the third cranial nerve, the high CA. Lateral to that, lateral to the anterior petroclinoid fold, there is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, which is going down to reach the temporal fossa. And you see also here that there are many, many blue elements, meaning that there is some venous blood between the, the two layers of dura mater. And if you remove the inner layer, which is the, the more superficial one, you open actually this area, then you open these uh, areas, so it means that you open actually two layers of dura mater, then you arrive in, uh, in these cavern trigeminale, and you see the, the, the trigeminal uh, nerve and the, the plexus, trigeminal plexus, which is located just posterior to uh, the trigeminal ganglion that will divide in the, the three different branches. If we now look from lateral, we are looking from, from here. If we now look from lateral, this is a right specimen. This is the anterior direction, the superior direction, posterior and inferior. Here you recognize the anterior petroclinoid fold, <coughs> which is the, line, the limit between the roof of the cavernous sinus, which would be there, and the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, which, which was removed to show its content. From superior, to uh, inferior, you see the ah, you see the third cranial nerve, which is there, going anterior and relatively uh, uh, inferiorly. Then you have the fourth cranial nerve. Remember, it was entering posterior, so it has to be inferior to the third cranial nerve. And you see here the first division or ophthalmic nerve of the 
the, the trigeminal uh, nerve, you recognize the trigeminal plexus, the trigeminal ganglion, and then which contains the, the cellular bodies of the, the trigeminal system, and then the first division of ophthalmic nerve. And you see that these three elements, three, four, and, and ophthalmic, are converging to the same point, and this point is actually the superior orbital fissure, and they will uh, quit the, the, the skull to enter the, 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 the middle cerebral fossa to enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. Then, of course, the limit of uh, uh, the, the inferior limit, the ventral limit of the cavernous sinus is quite virtual. And by definition, it is the superior aspect or dorsal aspect of the, uh, the maxillary uh, the maxillary nerve. There is no clear cut limit when you when you dissect. I will show you uh, that in a moment. But by definition, the inferior limit of the cavernous sinus is there, meaning that the the the, the maxillary nerve doesn't uh, belong to the cavernous sinus. The maxillary nerve then reach the foramen rotundum, which is there, whereas the mandibulary uh, division mandibular nerve reaches the foramen ovale to reach the infratemporal uh, region. You can define other triangles. Some of them are not really useful. Some are more well known. Uh, the first one is called the supratrochlear triangle between the third and the fourth cranial nerve. It is located here. It is quite small. The most important one, which is the the best known is the infratrochlear or Parkinson's triangle. <clears throat> As you can see, it is between the fourth cranial nerve and the ophthalmic nerve. It is there. And you see that it gives access to the posterior band of the ICA and to the posterior branches of the ICA, uh, intracavenous ICA. Then there are other triangles which are less important. The anterior medial uh, middle triangle <clears throat> middle, uh, sorry, <clears throat> anterior medial middle cerebral fossa triangle, which is gives, gives access to the sphenoid sinus, and here the anterior lateral uh, middle cerebral fossa triangle. But you can we, you, you can uh, forget them. The most important one is probably the the red one. If we now uh, perform a coronal slice like that, uh, you recognize several elements. You recognize here the which is a bit blurry, the, the pituitary uh, gland. You recognize the roof of the cavernous sinus, then the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, like that. This is here the, the sphenoid sinus, which, which is covered by the outer layer. And in between here, there is this space, and you see that this space is filled with a lot of fat and some venous element, which makes some small splits. I, I told you that a moment ago. And recognize several elements. First, you have the sixth cranial nerve, which is running within the cavernous sinus, just close to uh, the high CA. <clears throat> you remember it was entering the posterior, post the petroclival venous conference, and it was following the ICA to reach its lateral inferior, inferior uh, wall. It is there. And then more lateral, close to uh, the, the, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, you will recognize the third, uh, the third the cranial nerve, that's it, so the kudomotor nerve, then the fourth cranial nerve, which is very small, and then you will recognize the um, ophthalmic nerve, which is made of several fasciculi. What, uh, um, what we know is that these nerves are surrounded by uh, their own sheath, as it was the case for the sixth cranial nerve, and actually, the sheath of the third, fourth, and the ophthalmic nerve are fusing together, and they, they, they make a second layer, which is uh, bordering the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And it explains why you can dissect these elements without entering the cavernous sinus. There is a small layer in between, uh, between the cavernous sinus and these, uh, these elements. OK, we are almost at the end. Uh, so there are several take home messages. Uh, first of all, the cranial dura matter is made of two layers. It is really, really very important to understand that. Understand that. Without having this concept in mind, you won't understand anything in this anatomy. 
The second point, ah, crazy mouse. Uh, the second point is that the venous sinuses are, are running within the interdural space that I described a moment ago. And uh, the, the internal or inner uh, or cerebral uh, dura uh, lines two pouches, two important pouches. One is for the hypophysis, and it means that there is no straight medial wall of the cavernous sinus. So be very careful when you are dealing with MRI. Do not expect to have something straight. The hypophysis can go very lateral and above the ICA. And the other pouch is for the, the trigeminal nerve. This is the cavern trigeminale. And you see, see, you saw this complex organization of the cavern trigeminale. And probably the most important message is that you have to go to the lab to dissect. And uh, this is the only way, I think, to learn this uh, complex anatomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, Christophe. Uh, beautiful lecture, very clear and very important. Thank um, you. Yeah, Louis, what do you say about the lecture? Your opinion, Mr. Borba? We yeah. lost him. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But it's really thank you. I hope we continue our work uh, in our webinars. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Even, even for me, it's, it it will be very interesting. Even I have experience in covering sinus surgery. But most in, most interesting lecture. Most thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. No questions. No questions. Okay. No questions. Maybe next. Okay. Uh, Christoph. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. okay. And now uh, it's another another participant of our the web seminars is a very famous uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, all uh, especially young residents uh, neurosurgeon know him. It's uh, our our friends also. Uh, this is Ipcherian lectures. Uh, regret is no connection now because he now is moving on, on the trip. So in the airport, so no connection on the internet. So why we uh, connect to video? Oh, there is no sound. Okay, okay, no. Okay. Really missing being at Tumen. Uh, I mean, uh, they're from 2013 onwards. Uh, this COVID years has uh, been a difficult time for all of us, and I hope that we will cease all of us, uh, each other soon. Yeah. You know, you just... out in the first meeting that you will all come to, and I'll also be there. And after that, Rio, Louis meeting, and maybe Galapagos goes in between is the plan. So let me just uh, talk about the approaches to Kevin science. So as we all know, it is not just the approaches to cavernous science, but uh, the cavernous science is also a highway. So we're going to deal a little bit about the axial unlocking, sagittal unlocking, and the oblique interior unlocking that we talked about. So you can see that the cavernous science is medial to the temporal lobe. So it has three, four V1, six medial to V1, then V2, V3. But only up to V2 is the cavernous science. It doesn't have cavernous science. So we are going to tell you about the position, a little bit about the skin position. You can uh, make minimally invasive also like your Vedas. With the mid platter approach. So you have the craniotomy here. And so the first thing that we want to do is the sagittal unlock. Why do we do it? So, because after you do the sagittal unlocking, you have more exposure to the basic. So, what you are doing is the sphenoid ridge, you're going to take it off, and this fold, you are 
you wouldn't be able to open it up a little bit like that. So this won't have to have it. You take it down, then you're going to be able to get more access to the base. So the whole reason of going trans cavernous is uh, access to the base. So that is what I'm going to show you today. And the next is access. Sylvian dissection is in those things uh, as well. Earlier, this was the only way to describe it. But now we have uh, all of these ways which give such a beautiful exposure like this. So, um, this uh, this is the energy that you see once you open up everything. And, uh, you know, this is uh, literally a highway uh, to the skull base, starting to make the end of those. So, uh, these three unlockings, that is axial, sagittal, and intradural uh, oblique unlocking, uh, provides way to pathologies like bus latibanus, spirituclavo meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, giant pituitary normas, chordomas, and many more. So, we're showing a rupture past the aneurysm, which we've done through this route. Here, I don't have to go through the complete transcavernous technique, but here you can see the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And I'm dividing the uh, orbitomental back. So, this is uh, the beginning of uh, the transcavernous uh, approach. So, once the orbitomental back is divided, you will be able to slowly peel off the temporal dura and the frontal dura away from the anterior process. So you can uh, you can do this slowly by sharp incision and then some blunt incision with the dissector slowly and always take sutures as uh, Louis uh, puts it. Uh, sutures give you space while retractors take away your space. So you would want to always use uh, sutures in this area. And it's aromatic. I mean, you can put in a panty at this region. This is what we do now. We put a panty uh, below the suture so that the suture pressure is, uh, you know, uniformly applied. But uh, this doesn't really hurt anything as long as you haven't let out the CSF. So now we see that you're slowly opening up, slowly opening up that region. And that's the region of uh, the anterior climate process. So once you open up the anterior climate process region, if it's not a bad climate so you can go ahead and uh, slowly uh, start biting, biting it off with uh, uh, the lateral uh, anterior climate process can be easily removed with a uh, rongeur. Uh, but then of course, uh, if uh, it is an aneurysm, then you want to start drilling from the very beginning. So this is the client process. So slowly, and after that, you introduce your drill now. And uh, so with the drill, you, you're going to be drilling the client process. And people ask me, is there a specific way of drilling? No, all the bone you see there, you have to remove it gently, very gently. If you ask me, is there any, any technique to drill it? I would say gentle. So uh, very gently, you can remove all the bone and near the anterior climate process, I'm not going to be breaking it away. So I'm going to exhale it. So every bone that I see there, very gently, including the strut and the optic roof, under a lot of copious irrigation, we go ahead and take it out. There's no particular way to drill the base off and break it. And you can do that if you like doing it, but I generally keep exhaling it. So Whatever bone is in my field, I keep on taking it so that uh, you can easily, the, once you exhale, once you thin it down, you can remove uh, the bone off. So you can see now that I have completely uh, thinned out the bone uh, and even the optic uh, roof, I'm thinning it down uh, completely. And once I've done that, 
I'll be able to break it off like that, like that. So, and now you can see the optic now there, exterior optic now there. In fact, I just uh, did the same dissection, the National Skull Base uh, meeting. That's where we were. That's where I am right now, Jodhpur. So, uh, I am flying tomorrow, and uh, this talk is pre recorded. I wish I was with you at least online, but uh, that is uh, today we had this beautiful session in the International Skull Base where we did this dissection. So I am now, uh, I am slowly taking the temporal lobe away from the camera sense. You can see the camera sense here. So you, can, you might ask me why there's no bleeding from the camera sense. If you keep this membrane intact, you're not going to have any bleeding. And even if you have bleeding, you can start uh, injecting uh, glue between three and four, then B1 and B2, and then between four and B1. In fact, first between carotid and third, and then after between uh, B1 and B2, and uh, three and four, uh, between four and B1, and finally at the superior petrosal region if you're going quite back. But here in this case, I really don't need to go back. It's a basilatic aneurysm. So I am just dissecting uh, just enough so that I'm, I'm doing axial unlocking. So that I'm taking the temporal lobe out of my waist that. Uh, um, I get more space uh, to get into the interpenicular and deal with this basal aneurysm. So uh, that's what you're seeing now. I have, I have taken the temporal lobe quite laterally there as a temporal lobe. This was a frontal lobe, anterior clinal is out. And uh, you know, you, you have a lot of space, space right now. And this is exactly what I want. So once I have that, I can go ahead and open the dura. Um, so a little bit more up to probably V2, beginning of V3, I can peel off this dura, laterally uh, displace uh, uh, the temporal lobe. And once I've done that, then uh, I'm set for this case. I don't need to go all the way to V3 uh, or to the behind the V3. This is not a good reply with you, so I really don't need to do that. So I, I am, uh, and uh, uh, as many people say, there's no need to do all the steps uh, just because they, they are, you can tailor uh, for each case. So, so this is what I'm going to do. So once the camera sign, you can see the camera sign is beautifully there, there's no bleeding there. And because we have uh, preserved the true cavernous membrane, and the climber is out, and uh, so you can see the V1 there, the V2 this side, and the V3 will start, you will start seeing the V3 there, but I, I really don't need that now. So you put some cell there, so there's no oozing, then you open the dura, and you can see the optic nerve there, and the clinoid is taken out there, so uh, you don't have much of the clinoid. That's your third, that's your third now, that's your third now, and that's your PCOM. And so this is the uh, carotico oculomotor window. So I am looking for the basilar ruptured basilar here. Then I'm shifting back to the optical carotid window. And this is the optical carotid window. And I'm uh, going ahead and, and taking a little bit of uh, proximal uh, sylvian. So this also helps in distal dissection of my carotid. So uh, my window increases this way my window increases this way. So that's very important for me as well. So once I do that, I'm now dissecting the membrane of really fast and coming into the vast lab uh, right now. So that's a third ventricle. Uh, I mean, sorry, that's a membrane of really that's a third now. So this, this is a ruptured vast lab. There's a lot of blood in there. So in the optical carotid uh, space, I am dissecting the membrane of really fast right now. And I'm seeing the basilar there. Now, once I see the basilar, the first thing that I need to figure out is where is the third now? The biggest truth in basilar aneurysm surgery is the third now. If you find the contralateral third now, that, that white thing is the contralateral third now. That is the contralateral third now. Once there's a contralateral third now, I know everything about that is P1, that is P1, and and that's the basilar. 
So the aneurysm is backwards pointing. That's the thing, you know, this eruption aneurysm is pointing backwards. So I need to get a plane between, I need to get a plane between the P1 and this aneurysm. So that's what I need to do. So I, I am making a plane between the P1 uh, slowly. This has to be very gentle because this aneurysm is backward pointing. And uh, if you rupture it, it's, it's just a bit of a problem. You have to go under cardiac arrest. So uh, we don't have any proximal control here, absolutely no proximal control. So I, I don't like putting in a, a clip on the basal P1 and all that. And that takes your space away and plus you're always under tight pressure. But here, uh, you're not. So I'm very, I can take all my time in the world to descend this gently, very, very gently. So I make space between the P1 and the aneurysm. And once I, once I can, I can pass my bisector all the way across there. You see, that's a neck of aneurysm. That, that although um, that, that's a neck of aneurysm, that's not the fun. So you really don't have to, no need to be unnecessarily worrying. Of course, cannot move the funnels of that aneurysm. So that is uh, that is your P1, and you, you mobilize, you put in your suction, a round instrument like the suction. And gently, gently move that uh, aneurysm neck a little bit more. And you have the P1 there, you have the basilar there, and you have the aneurysm. So that anatomy is it's, it's very, very clear for you. And then once you do that, on this side, you see where you, you have space to put the clip on. And once you do that, uh, you're going to put the clip on. So uh, the first clip is a bit superficial so that the aneurysm kind of collapses and you kind of reapply it and you, you completely clip the aneurysm. And after clipping the aneurysm, you look at whether there's uh, any distal filling, there's nothing there, there's nothing in that distal region. So the aneurysm is kind of clear. Uh, thank you very much. I am stopping to share. And once more, uh, my best regards to all of you. And I hope I see you soon. OK. OK. Thank you to Professor Ayab. Uh, beautiful, excellent lecture about very difficult uh, uh, fault uh, of cavernous sinus surgery. Uh, Professor Ayab uh, explained to us about the anterior petrosal approach. Uh, this is uh, one of the most important and most frequently used approach. And uh, for neurosurgeons who want to start, uh, to start, um, this is the first step, uh, first step, first level of the understanding of this kind of, of this kind of approach. And especially, if, of course, this approach is very useful for the aneurysm surgery, for basal bifurcation, for, for tumors lo uh, localized in this area, trigeminal, schwannoma, and so on and so on. So uh, again, the neurosurgeons must know very well this uh, region and this kind of approach is very important. Um, but now an, a, a, another giant of uh, skull base uh, neurosurgery, uh, our teacher uh, in this uh, file of uh, neurosurgery, uh, Professor Luis Borba. Please, Luis. Luis, please. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Okay, please start. Okay, maybe some problem with connections. Okay. Okay. Luis, let go. Let go. Uh, 
Now, uh, okay. Lewis, Lewis, what's happened? Possible? The pursuit demonstrates it. Okay, a little bit problem with the connections, but uh, another giant of skull based surgeon, our teacher in this kind of, of surgery, Luis Borba, also say us uh, your opinion, your view uh, of approaches to the cavernous sinus. And we know the a very famous uh, neurosurgeon, and his main interest is the posterior, uh, also posterior uh, uh, petrosal approach. A special yugula foramen tumors uh, experts. On the zvuk отключен. No problem. No problem. Little, little bit of it. Little bit of it. Можно тогда тогда мы Hi, I can see you. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Okay. Please start, Luis. Please start. Okay, okay. Ali is in the phone. Hello? Hello, hello. You can hear. It's okay. It's okay. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. 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 So some problem who. Uh, объяснить, чтобы это дальше. Okay, so some problem with the connection with the professor Luis Borba. Uh, so why maybe I I will continue uh, our lecture about our experience because uh, about the pituitary gland and pituitary transposition. Okay. Borba. Okay. Okay, pituitary transposition, microsurgical and endoscopic transnasal approaches. How I do it? Uh, I will try to uh, show the example of cadaver dissection and live surgery examples. Uh, pituitary gland transposition is uh, uh, not so not so uh, frequently used uh, operation, but uh, sometimes it's very useful, especially in difficult case. 
and the approach is divided by the two two directions the first one is the transcranial transbasal approach and the second one is endoscopic transnasal and the main goal of the pituitary gland transposition is uh, to access uh, just to behind the pituitary gland and in, in infundibular structures, uh, just uh, for including critical neurovascular structures like uh, in, interpeduncular system, retroclival, and retrochiasmal areas. And also, a preservation of the pituitary capsule during this transposition is uh, more, uh, important to avoid the gland damage and facilitate dissection. And you see, and you see the, the, the angle of the view uh, in our experience, in our cadaver lab, what we receive um, uh, during the transbasal and endoscopic approach. And you see the transbasal is uh, near the 30 degrees and the, and the, the endovascular, in our experience, more than 20 degrees, but it's enough for the good surgery. Uh, the, we know now and uh, two, uh, uh, two free, free, three main uh, ways to access the dorsum cella because the dorsum cella and the posterior clinoid is the key structures just to uh, to uh, receive the good access to the uh, uh, this uh, area what i explained before so why uh, the main is uh, may frequently used in our also experience is the uh, um, uh, uh, intradural 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 uh, approach in this kind of approach uh, the main criteria is uh, the medial wall medial wall of the of the uh, of the capsule of the cavernous sinus, uh, sorry, uh, is the intact. You see the intact. Uh, so, so is, this is the intradural approach. The medial is the uh, intact. The next uh, uh, next uh, most important uh, approach is may may be, may be rapidly developed now, and also in our federal center of neurosurgery is the transcavernous approach. In this kind of approach. Uh, uh, medial wall is destroyed and we open completely the uh, ICA, intercavernous part, and also it's very important because in this situation, especially you, if you operate some difficult case, uh, you uh, have uh, control, proximal vascular control. Sometimes it's very, very important because uh, some difficult case is very important. So why uh, transcavernous approach, uh, for uh, my opinion, in some most challenged cases, is um, more useful. And uh, again, uh, and again, uh, uh, you, uh, you you know, uh, intradural or uh, extradural also possible uh, just to uh, go without the open the. Uh, the, the dura mater and uh, destroy the outer inner layer. Uh, and also uh, variation, uh, depending on the direction of the transposition, it, it's possible uh, to create the lateral transposition only like this. And this is hemi-transposition and completely total superior transposition of all, all pituitary gland. Uh, but uh, it's not necessary uh, so sometimes. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, only hemi-transposition is enough for uh, this kind of surgery. And again, uh, and again, what is the key for, for, for this kind of surgery? Because the, the main structure, uh, in my opinion, is the posterior clinoid. So this transposition must uh, create the good approaches for uh, uh, removal of posterior clinoid or dorsum or dorsum cell. And another is the good mobilization of the pituitary gland and safe mobilization. Uh, the most important structure is the vascular. You see the inferior hypophyseal artery. And for, uh, for these kinds of transposition of mobilization, it doesn't matter hemi-transposition or superior transposition. You must also the, 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 the safely cut and you must know about this inferior hypophyseal artery. And for good mobilization of the ICA or maybe pituitary gland transposition, you must uh, cut this artery very safely. And only after open 
safe way and uh, you must create uh, any type of operation behind of the pituitary gland. Now we go to the trans open microsurgery and for open microsurgery we uh, uh, standardly use some uh, trans basal approach and uh, uh, it's, it's levels also. Uh, we have some levels of uh, this transbasal approach. It depends from the uh, clinical situation, experience, and uh, uh, some equipment what we have in, in, in clinics. So why uh, we use uh, possible to use standard transbasal approach? It's uh, like this you see on this slide. Uh, standard transbasal approach without orbital, orbital or and nasal osteotomy, just only uh, uh, frontal flap. You see. Uh, another level uh, is uh, level one. Uh, level one includes additional uh, orbital uh, uh, reach and nasal uh, osteotomy, you see, like this. And the uh, next uh, two levels is uh, more uh, difficult uh, and more traumatic. And, and if, if you open medial wall of the um, uh, and superior fissure uh, uh, and you use uh, uh, also nasal bone, this is uh, level uh, level two, uh, you see like in, in this picture. And if you, you open additionally uh, lateral wall of orbit and uh, inferior inferior uh, fissure, like, like, like this, uh, this is level three osteotomy. Uh, more detail you see in this slide. In our, in our clinic, we uh, modified this kind of transbasal approach and we use one piece bone flap uh, transbasal approach. You see like this. And dissection of the dura, we create through the only two bar hole, uh, two, two, two holes, one is bar hole, just above of the superior sinus, like see, you, uh, possible to see in this picture. And another, uh, we go through the, through the frontal sinus open front and sinus and uh, dissect uh, uh, the dura uh, from this uh, hole. And in this situation, it's possible to create one piece bone flap transbasal approach. Uh, you see uh, the advantages of this kind of uh, approach. Uh, uh, midline visualization of in inferiorly into the interpedinculate system is possible. Also possible uh, lamin view of laminar terminalis and retrochiasmal region is ma maximized if the tumors grows up, for example. Hypothalamus can be adequately visualized, visual, visualized and eliminated the blind uh, spot. Uh, also possible maximal even inferior limit of tumor resection in the interpeduncular system and retrocellular region. And also uh, this is a safe way to the all medial, anterior, inferior surface of intracavernous part of ICA. And if necessary, it's possible to mobilize uh, with good proximal control. It's very important, especially in, in challenge cases. Mm. Uh, but uh, for this kind of approach, uh, uh, um, residents or young neurosurgeons uh, surgeons, uh, must uh, have good training. And uh, for good training, you have good lab. Uh, this kind of equipment is necessary just to organize this uh, process of understanding of this approach. And in our, in our lab, we use uh, standardly uh, high-speed cryotomy like a striker or uh, ultrasonic mysonic bony scalp. It's a very useful uh, device for this kind of uh, craniotomy. You see the ultrasonic uh, mysonic bony scalp with uh, 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 different shape of the blade. Surgical technique uh, we show in this slide, and this is the standard situation. Uh, Bifrontal craniotomy with anterior part with the supraorbital complex. You see, the most important is uh, because in all skull based surgery, most important is uh, the close of the wound. So, why uh, the create the periosteum flap is a very, 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 very important. And another, the, the, the superorbital notch also divide. Also, very important step just to save the superorbital nerves. 
Uh, the next step was after open the after open the, the frontal sinus, uh, it's very easy to separate uh, from uh, from and remove crystal galley. And then extradural approach very easy to create. Resection of the planum sphenoidale. Next important uh, in this area, next important uh, step. And then it's possible to use uh, operation view after the removal of the uh, plenum sphenoidale and you see the dura mater in this area. Uh, next step is to separation decision the dura, lies, diaphragm, and ligaments from pituitary glands. I see, and you see the and extra dural posterior craniotomy and dorsum cell is possible. And it is, it, it is the key for the safe surgery uh, in the, uh, this uh, retrohiasmatic uh, area, for example. You see the step for the hemisex, uh, hemi, hemi uh, transposition of a pituitary gland, some uh, important structure like IC, ICA and the uh, optic nodes and, and so on. After that, uh, buzzable uh, of the uh, system is possible to, 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 to show and good access to this area is possible. You see the uh, or, or wide view of the, uh, this area and the pituitary gland uh, transported above and the basal artery and the ICA, optic nerve and so on. Easy to come to, for example, for the bifurcation of basal artery, for example. Again, again, to understand the, the free type of uh, 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 transposition is, is possible, intradural, uh, you see uh, um, uh, middle wall of the cavernous sinus is intact and you don't see the ICU in this kind of approach. Just uh, again, uh, transcavernous, you go, go through the cavernous sinus and see you open the ICU and possible control if, if necessary. And this is uh, the extradural transposition. And again, hemi-transposition, super is possible. Uh, we will lay some angles uh, for attack uh, in the working area. And uh, uh, you see the, uh, even uh, hemi-transposition, it's very useful and give uh, wide opening, uh, enough opening for the uh, surgical manipulation in, in this difficult area retrohiasmatic or uh, supraclivus and behind of the pituitary gland. And uh, it's possible to, to compare some approaches uh, used before to, to, this, uh, to this area. And you see the angles and view of attacks is not so good. So uh, transposition of the uh, uh, pituitary gland is uh, now one of the most uh, important approach to this challenge area. But uh, this approach also have some problems and the challenge and drawbacks or so, like it necessarily some uh, uh, frontal lobe manipulation. Uh, despite of a significant intensive dissection of the phenol working space is not so, so widely uh, and sometimes intercardiac artery also main obstacles in the way of the lateral di di direction and the preservation or sacrifice of noise is necessary. So one example, so I want to, to show the, the our participants. And now let's consider the open transbasal approach. With a face up head position, a bioricular skin incision is made while preserving the periosteum flap with intact frontal branches of nerves. Mm. We perform a thorough dissection of the superior wall of the orbit and the frontal bone up to the nasium. The anterior wall of the frontal sinus, according to preliminary CT scans, is opened without damaging the mucous membrane of the sinus and sealed at the level of the frontal sinus osteum. Through the opening of the posterior wall of the frontal sinus, the frontoorbital mingeolysis is performed with cotton pads placed under the bone along the bone resection line to avoid damaging the dura mater. The orbital part of the approach is performed using a bone scalpel, mysonics, 
and the frontal part of the approach is performed using a conventional striker craniotomy, one-piece bone flap. The dura matter of the olfactory fossa is dissected. The crista galley is removed. The ethmoidal arteries are coagulated. The olfactory nerves are exposed and resected with the epithelial mucosa and receptors being preserved. Now we change the downward viewing angle and open the planum sinoidale together with the tuberculum cellae. After opening, the sphenoid sinus mucosa is sealed with a tachycomb. Here you can see the projection of the neurovascular structures. We open the dura mater along the medial edge of the ICA and optic nerve. We can observe the diaphragma cellae, which is one of the folds of the dura mater. And from the diaphragm run the superior anterior lateral ligaments, which are attached to the medial wall of the cavernous sinus and the ICA wall. The superior anterior lateral and posterior lateral ligaments are not clearly differentiated from each other. The inferior anterior lateral and posterior lateral ligaments run through the adena and neurohypophysial veins and arteries. The diaphragm of the cella torsica is tightly attached to the base of the stalk of the pituitary gland, without a complete incision of which it is impossible to release and transpose it fully. For hemitransposition, it is sufficient, apart from the ligaments, to dissect the diaphragm along the perimeter on one side. In cases when the full mobility of the pituitary gland is necessary, we carry out similar manipulations from the opposite side. We also resect the anterior superior lateral ligament, posterior superior lateral ligament. We resect the diaphragm. Inferior posterior and inferior anterior lateral ligaments. In addition to the lateral ligaments, there are anterior and posterior median ligaments, which are subject to mandatory resection for total pituitary mobility. To obtain a wide view into the retroclival area, it is possible to remove the bony part of the dorsum cellae while preserving the dura mater. This gives access to the structures of the basal systems, pons, basal artery, and others. For closure, periosteal autographs are used. The dura mater is tightly sutured in the area of the cella torsica base and olfactory fossa. The hecomb is applied on both sides of the dura mater. The sphenoid sinus and the olfactory fossa are additionally sealed with a periosteum flap, fat autograft, ibocyl fibrin sealant, and pedunculated periosteum flap is searched to the dura mater of the frontal lobe. The bone flap is placed and the soft tissues are searched in layers. Uh, so this is an example of our dissection. Uh, uh, how we do it, this kind of approach, and the main landmark and some tips uh, about this not, not easy, not easy approach. But sometimes it's uh, only one way to to give a surgery. Another most important uh, now most developed and most minimally invasive uh, this is endoscopic uh, pituitary trans uh, transposition approach. 
the most important names is Amin Kassam, the, the Prividella, and uh, so on. So uh, Schneider, Gardner, uh, Carrao, this is the pioneers of this kind of endoscopic approach. It's Endoscopic uh, approach has some adventures. It is really minimally invasive without, without frontal neuropsychological syndrome in early post-operative period, preservation of olfactorinov and, and so on. It's really, it's, it's really a good approach. Uh, it, uh, this approach includes some steps. Some steps is classic, some steps is not classic. Uh, but uh, also the, this approach is also disadvantaged because uh, have a, a lot of experience in in endonasal and in, in nasal uh, uh, surgery, endoscopic surgery, and uh, need big uh, learn curve for the surgeon. I, for my opinion, is one of most uh, most um, disadvantages. Uh, but also contra for bleeding, hemostasis, uh, uh, also uh, disadvantaged of this kind of approach. Uh, most important uh, in these uh, uh, approaches is uh, how to remove the posterior cranoid or uh, dorsal is the key for this kind of approach. So also these uh, guys also describe his technique of, for example, endoscopic posterior cranoidotomy and so on. Indications uh, very wide now and, uh, and indications develop and in experienced hand. Uh, most of uh, most of uh, difficult tumors, most difficult tumors possible to treat uh, by this kind of approach. So why the cardomas, chondrosarcomas of the, the paracera, retrocera, supracera extension is possible. Uh, again, uh, most important is the petroclival meningiomas because uh, even all surgery not uh, all time decides the problem. Uh, retrocera cranial pharyngiomas, retrocera tumors, uh, aneurysms, so, so a lot of challenge, really challenge situations. Now it's possible to decide uh, with this kind of approach. And uh, we must learn more in this direction also. Uh, this is uh, the, some kit, some equipment, what we use for this approach. Uh, this is the standard ENT or uh, skull-based neurosurgeons uh, instruments hooks, purines, aspirators, but for this kind of surgery, you must have all size, all shapes. It's very important. Not only one size, not only one shape. 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 Also, some good drills, some debriders uh, with uh, uh, different angles, uh, very important to use for safe surgery. Surgical technique uh, includes some steps. For example, first step, first step is the removal of the middle turbinate. You see, standard technique. Open the, uh, open the sphenoetmoidal uh, sphenoet, sphenoet RSS, like you, you see. And uh, most important, one of the important steps is to create the another set of flap. For example, Hadachi flap, for example. You see the step in this slide. Also, next step is removing the nasal septum, uh, removal of the uh, anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus and the open sphenoid sinus. After open the sphenoid sinus, you see you, it's possible to see a picture uh, like this picture with main important landmarks. The main important mass is the anterior uh, fossa. Uh, uh, sorry the uh, pituitary, uh, pituitary uh, gland uh, uh, wall, cavernous sinus, ICA, cavernous ICA, optic nerves, optic chiasm. And uh, in this picture, I try to show the anatomy of the pituitary gland and the infundibulum. This is the most important structure what we, we uh, uh, to operate, manipulate our own these structures. Again, the scheme about the transposition, intradural, extradural, hemi, super, and so on. And again, most important, just to safely cut off the inferior hypophysal artery and remove the posterior crinoid. 
most important, most important state. Again, uh, intradurally, the safe media wall of the cavernous sinus is an intradural approach. If the wall inside of the uh, cavernous sinus, this is a transcavernous approach. Benefit uh, is uh, uh, does not be uh, 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 no doubt about the advantages of this and now approach it's uh, very important and uh, i want to show the example of the endoscopic dissection with pituitary the endoscopic approach first of all the out fracture of the inferior turbinate is performed to do this more effectively the turbinate is first medialized and then pressed with a dissector against the lateral wall of the nasal cavity to expand the nasal passage At the next the horizontal plate of the middle turbinate is removed and shifted downward. The next stage is the removal of the ethmoid mucosa. Then we observe the natural osteum of the sphenoid sinus and an open posterior ethmoid cell. And this is a scheme for taking nasoceptal flap if needed or rescue flap. We expand the natural osteum and remove the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus as wide as possible. We get inside the sinus and we can visualize the anatomical structures inside the sinus. We observe the bony prominences of the main bony landmarks indicated in the following figure. Then we remove the bony part of the bottom of the cell at Tersica and also remove the planum sphenoidale. In the figure, we see the proximal annulus fibrosis and other anatomical structures. After that, the dura mater is opened, including the area anterior to the chiasm, and the section begins. We can see the fibers of the arachnoid and the hypophyseal stalk. The pituitary gland is dissected from the dura using various endoscopic instruments. Here we can see the right anterior inferior hypophyseal ligament. On the other side, by careful dissection, we approach the left inferior posterior hypophyseal ligament. Here we find the inferior pituitary artery, a branch of the meningo hypophyseal trunk, and dissected for the subsequent transposition. By gentle upward traction, we can expose the right lower pituitary artery and the right lower posterior hypophyseal ligament. Thus, the pituitary transposition upward is accomplished and the cell atersic is exposed, which allows performing the expanded posterior superior approach. Okay, uh, this is an example of the um, some before I show the example of the some cadaveric dissection, but uh, now I want to show the some uh, clinical clinical case about the, how we use uh, the transposition of pituitary gland in um, in life surgery. You see the you see the tumor uh, what which uh, what localized in interpinucular surgery, but uh, in retrohiasmatic very, very difficult uh, for, for surgical access area with 16 years old with severe hormone, hormonal uh, disturbances. So why uh, we decide uh, the direct in the, uh, this situation, it uh, was a direct indication for the transbasal approach with pituitary gland transposition, just for minimally uh, to minimize uh, the uh, surgical uh, aggressive, aggressive. And first one, we create the, some transbasal approach in our modification. Uh, you see, 
uh, we cut the anterior wall, uh, open the frontal sinus, and dissect. And they have uh, they have drilling posterior bone and dissect the dura. And now we, with bony scalpel with my sonics, we create the osteo flap, one one piece transbasal approach. And now we try to, to recognize the tumor and recognize the main vessels around the tumors uh, inside uh, 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 in, the, in our way to the to the to the tumor. And uh, this is the intradural approach, uh, intergemispheric, and now we open the chiasma area, and now we uh, um, cut the, the, the dura above the, the Planum sphenoidale, you see, and uh, dissect the tumor, uh, the, the dura, and then we uh, remove the planum sphenoidale by drill and open the sphenoid sinus widely. By Rudgens also, see the chiasm, hemostasis. Now cut the, cut the dura, uh, and now we open the cella and you see the pituitary gland with the, some ligaments very well and very easy to dissect and now cut more and more posteriorly the dura above the clavus and now we see the very good approach to the uh, posterior inter uh, posterior uh, interpinuclear system. It's very easy approach. And you see hemi transport hypothesis, the tumor, chiasm. And now we start to remove the tumor. It's very easy. No, no, no press as the, the, the important structure. Additional, additional uh, part of tumors we remove through the opening of the lamina terminalis. And now this, uh, after total removing, we close the wound, we close the approach, how we describe in the, our cadaver dissection video. This is uh, before operation. This is after operation, total, total removal. Again, again, the uh, home message, uh, neuroanatomy research is, is the key for building high level career in neurosurgery. So, so you might, uh, young residents, neurosurgeons, young neurosurgeons uh, must have uh, access to the cadaver lab, very well equipped cadaver lab. This is very important, especially in the young steps. Uh, our Federal Center of Neurosurgery have this uh, kind of uh, anatomical lab. And we always open and we always wait uh, upcoming stars, young upcoming stars in neurosurgery. Contact telephone. Thank you for your attention. Uh, next, uh, next it was uh, Luis Borba. I'm here. Can you see me? Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Louis, beautiful. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now it's a Louis Borba lecture. The giant leader, prominent, world prominent uh, uh, neurosurgeon, skull by surgery. Our teaching skull by surgery. Louis, please. Okay. Okay, I try to. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, yes, now it's possible, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about this technical problem. I'm no out, problem. outside no the home here. For oh, you, no problem. The connection. Louis, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> the connection sometimes not good. Uh, the surgery of sign has changed a lot in the last years. In the 80s, the people start to understand the philosophy, try to understand the anatomy of the cavernous sinus. In the 90s, everybody, was doing surgery in the cavernous sinus. 
And the work of Professor Donnelly show the real way how you can treat, you can manage tumors the cavernous sinus. But what's happened these days that is that so many people start to do surgery the cavernous sinus and the complications and the level of complications was very, very high. Because we didn't understand not only the anatomy, but the pathology. The anatomy of the cavernous sinus, Professor Christoph show, uh, IP show, and Professor Sufianov that show before, I cannot say anything more. But there are many, many ways to reach the cavernous sinus. But before to do surgery, we need to know the natural history of this pathology. Look at this meningioma of the cavernous sinus that you found in the MRI. See, 78% of the patient regress the symptoms just of corticoid. Don't need more than this. And 90%, of, you know, 90, 90, 90% of the, the case, the, the, the symptoms doesn't come back. It's very, very important to understand. When you follow these meningiomas, these small meningiomas that is located inside the cavernous sinus, 19% will increase the size. 71% remain stable. And 9.4 decrease in size. These numbers are very similar to the number of radio surgery for meningioma. If the sign come up, they say, oh, maybe the result of radio surgery for meningioma of the cavernous sinus is related to the natural history more than the real efficacy of the treatment of radiation therapy. And the height of complication also there is with radio surgery. But look, look this here, this five case that fail the treatment, F, uh, I'm sorry, five case that grow the tumor, see? In these five, see? Four are treated for radio surgery, one with radiation therapy. In one patient, just one patient, the tumor decreases with radiation therapy. In this patient, they develop a radiation induced meningioma. It means that it's not so benign that you imagine. If you have a case like this, invasion of the cavernous sinus, 66 year old female. No neurological deficit, just headache. Don't need surgery. Don't need radio surgery. This patient just needs to follow it. But the possibility to get new deficit and the possibility that it will be impossible to remove this tumor, it makes us to think that the natural history will be better than any kind, any kind of treatment. Another situation like this, if you compare the treatment, radiation as a primary treatment, okay? 8% control in eight years. Radiation after proof that the tumor is growing, 45% in eight years. Just observe and see what's happened. 70% control in eight years. That means that the natural history of radiation in advance and the natural, uh, compare with the natural history of the disease is very, very similar. Wait and see. It's one important thing that you can learn in scalp research. That's to think that radiation is not good, just uh, is not developed before benign tumors. You see what happened when many, many people came after the Second War. Many Jewish people from Russia, from the area, moved to Israel. And these people had tinea cacti. See? And they treat the, the tinea cacti with very low doses of radiation. What's happened? Radiation induced meningioma. Radiation induced meningioma is 
a very aggressive religion. Are you hearing? Are you hearing? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, no, okay, okay. Let's go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay. let's go. If, if you stop, please tell me, okay? No, 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 okay, okay, yeah, of course. Okay. What are the events the neurosurgery of Scavenal Science that left you? First, anatomy. Second, microsurgery. Third, technology. And one more, so don't understand the disease. Now you know how the disease works and how to reach the cavernous sinus. You can come from the nose, you call inferior medium. You can come lateral. You can come posterior, follow a tumor that comes from the posterior fossa, or you can come superior. The superior go direct the superior wall of the cavernous sinus. The transferator root is a direct root to the medial part of the cavernous sinus. This part, you can identify the artery and the tumor, especially the pituitary tumor that comes laterally and invade the cavernous sinus, you can follow the tumor. See, just follow the money, you know? Go follow the tumor through the cavernous sinus and go inside the cavernous sinus. When the tumor is outside the artery, sometimes you can reach for the nose, but it's not the safest way to reach the cavernous sinus. You have an example like this, a case like this, you just follow the tumor. Just follow the tumor from the nose to this area here. And sometimes you can remove, you, you never know how much you can remove by a transnasal approach. You never know. Sometimes you think you remove a lot. Sometimes you, 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 you not remove, but in this situation, we start to do the, the removal of the tumor cut. This is the case, and the pass up, you see, you can clean very, very well the cavernous sinus just through transnasal approach, as Professor Sufiano just showed. You can extend the approach. Now you can do this just by transnasal. You don't need, you don't need to do sublabel, and you can go lateral, just following the tumor. Look at the situation here. The tumor was inside the cella. You just follow the tumor on this part. In this area that you think they could not remove by the nose, you could, because the tumor gave you the root. The tumor gave the approach to you. The most common way to reach the cavernous sinus is that this way, frontal temporal root, by COZ, by doling, you see. In the idea, you do the peeling of the middle fossa, you expose the area, you have hold the, cover, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus in your hand. One trick for the young people, for the residents, one, now the patient has, is concerned about the uh, cosmetic, the aesthetic. It's very important to understand that to preserve the fascia and the vascularization of the temporalis muscle to avoid atrophy of the muscle. Very, very important. I'm not using too much COZ. I'm using now a lot of Dolink approach. It's a variation of paternal approach. In this idea, you can reach the cavernous sinus safely without need to remove them. How to remove the anterior clinoid? To open the window, you need to remove the anterior clinoid. You can do it by different ways. For vascular lesions, I prefer to remove the anterior clinoid intradurally. For tumor lesions, I prefer to remove the clinoid extradural. You hit example here. Here I remove extradural. I open the dura. Here I'm removing extradural was a meningioma. And down here is an aneurysm. See the small aneurysm here? You can see here. I need to remove the clinoid a minimal part, just, just to expose the neck of aneurysm. No need to remove too much. We open the false form ligament to liberate totally the optic nerve. See, in this is a way to remove the anterior clinoid. What's the most difficult part of the cavernocyte? The most difficult part of the cavernocyte is not the ICA, not the nerves in the lateral wall. 
the most difficult part is the superior orbital fissure. In the superior orbital fissure, all the nerves are together. If there is invasion of the superior orbital fissure by meningioma, for example, in my hand, it's impossible to remove. To learn in neurosurgery, you need to go to the lab. To learn skull base, you need to go to the lab and dissect and dissect and dissect. The way you understand the anatomy, you understand how to reach. This is the right side. We are doing peeling of the middle fossa. You see, here is the, is the hoof of the opt canal. We expose this part. We need to unroof totally the, 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 the opt canal. This way you can liberate the, the opt nerve. Sometimes at least mobilize a little bit to have the exposure. The anterior cranial, I prefer to remove, to drill first inside and make a very small egg shell. After that, you can, you, you can remove the anterior clinoid. Here's the opt nerve exposed. Here's the clinoid, the anterior clinoid. The remaining is the anterior clinoid. When you remove this remaining part of the anterior clinoid, you expose the artery, the ICA, in the clinoidal ligament, the clinoidal ligament, uh, the clinoidal segment, not the segment, and now start to peeling from anterior to posterior. If the tumor is in this part, you do the peeling just in the anterior part. Oh, sorry. I go for faster here. Oh. Okay, you see, you're doing the peeling just in the anterior part, see? If you go to the back and it's identify the middle meningeal artery and dissect in this direction, anterior to posterior, not lateral to lateral. And this you find V2, you find V3, you find the middle meningeal artery. You need to cut the middle meningeal artery to expose totally the cavernous sinus. It's very important in the word peeling. Peeling is peeling, it's not cutting. See, you are separating the dura from the middle fossa. If the tumor goes to the anterior fossa, you can open the dura and anterior and follow it from the anterior fossa to the middle fossa. And if you remove the, the petrous apex, you can go to the posterior fossa. It's very, very important to understand this analysis. And the extension of the dissection is related to extension and location of the lesion. See? If the lesion is located in the anterior part, you don't need to go back. If, in the, if the tumor is the lesion is located in the back, you don't need to go in front. This is one important step of the di dissection. You see, you totally liberate the ICA and it goes to the other side the optic nerve in the other side. The cavernous sinus in this part, but if you need to go back, we need to remove the anterior, the petrous apex to have more exposure. Let's show some cases. These are a large tumor. This is not cavernous sinus meningioma. The people say, oh, cavernous sinus, no cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus is here. See, it's, there is no tumor inside the cavernous sinus. This tumor is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. It's the anterior clinoid of any job. Just to the peeling, remove the anterior clinoid, and you have everything in front of you. You can get a very nice removal. Sometimes you have a case like this. Very small tumor. See, very small lesion, not tumor. What's it? This is small piece. Meningioma, cancer, Inflammatory, the patient has no pain. There is no pain, the possibility to be an inflammatory disease is rare. It's not, maybe it's low. We try high doses of steroids, didn't work. We decide to do the surgery. Went there, if the pill is the middle fossa, what we found? A meningioma, a small meningioma 
in the parks of Triangle, where this is the place where the meningioma arise in the area of the parks of Triangle, fourth nerve of superior, V1 inferior, and you go directly to this part. Today, I'm doing more and more of this small case, you know, but if it is start, if you take the tumor in the beginning, it's much, much, much better than to wait and see if the tumor will grow or not. You see, you can clean this very well. You can clean the area and the post-op, you can preserve the ocular motor function and you can remove <coughs> totally the tumor and save the life of the patient. You have situation like this, that there is tumor in the superior orbital fissure. If there is tumor in the superior orbital fissure, if you try to remove, you have a severe deficit. In this situation, we prefer to do this. You open the sinoid sinus, you remove the parts of the sinoid sinus, but we do the peeling of the middle fossa, expose all the area, remove the maximum that you can, the tumor in the cavernous sinus, but leave one small piece in the superior orbital fissure, more anterior, and just wait and see. Wait and see. If this remaining tumor is, is, uh, start to grow, okay, maybe you send to radio surgery, but not in advance. Superior orbital fissure, preserve the mobility, leave this small piece, it just follow, just follow. Another situation very similar, you see here, same case, maybe a small piece. Ocular motor function preserved. Pituitary is different, chordoma is different, schwannoma are different. Meningioma is one history, no meningioma is another history. It's a patient with a pituitary tumor that was operated three times by transcranial and transphenoidal, and came to me with the tumor that was growing here. How can I do? In this situation, I prefer to do the transcranial approach. You can go transcranial. You open the cavernous sinus. See, here's the third nerve is displaced, the third nerve medially. Okay. And you go there, you separate the temporal lobe. And you go in the superior wall of the cavernous sinus. Remove this part in the superior wall that was outside the cavernous sinus. Now you go inside the cavernous sinus, see? And follow, here's the superarachnoid space, fourth nerve, basilar, the, the border of the tentorium, and the third nerve here, and the fourth nerve is there, the third, parater, you went lateral, just through the superior, superior wall of the cavernous sinus. Here, see? Superior wall of the cavernous sinus. Third nerve, carotid, superior wall of the cavernous sinus. The third nerve is, is laterally, and the tumor is there. This is the fourth, the basilar, all the anatomy here. And the post-op, the patient has left it. That's the common here, the post-op. Pitosis, immediate post-op. 30-day post-op, recovery totally the eye and the radical removal of the tumor in the cavernous sinus, and also in the area of the pituitary fossa. Another situation like this, prolactinoma is a tumor to be treated by, by medication, it's not surgical indication, but this case is very interesting. A 50, 57 years old male uh, doctor, he tried high doses of cabergonine, didn't work, he changed for Bromocryptin in high doses, what's happened? Bleed, severe bleed inside the tumor. We went to do surgery in this case of prolactinoma to remove the clot and remove the tumor, but not means that the indication for surgery. And the indication for surgery was because the clot, see? We did the surgery by transcranial and removed totally the tumor. It's very interesting that this case, very large prolactinoma, now is not using medication. It's rare, extremely rare, the situation. I have a tumor like this, prolactinoma of this size, 
that you do surgery in the patient control or cure is very, very, very rare. You can come to the cavernous sinus from the posterior fossa. You can come from the retrocyc, or you can come from the from the from the Meckel's case, or you can come also from anterior fossa from the petrous apex. This is the case. The tumor was in the Meckel's case. You just follow the tumor from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa and go follow the turner. The great majority of this tumor, this, this situation is not invading the cavernous sinus. The tumor is in the Meckel's case. The same situation is this. I don't know if you can see this video is published in 3D in the, in the operative nerve surgery. In 3D, you can see the anatomy very well. Here you cannot see well the third, the fourth, see? And you can clean this. Go to the end here, you can see. You see the fourth, the posterior cerebral, the third nerve, the fifth nerve. Go to operative nerve surgery and you can see better this video. Another situation is this. This patient came to me after a nerve surgery, see him and say, oh, you do the retrosigmoid approach. You remove this part and leave this part of the cavernous sinus. Oh my God. It's not cavernous sinus. It's Meckel's case. Cavernous sinus is more anterior. You look at what's happened here. Look at this small piece here. This, this fifth nerve, the trigeminal nerve. It means that the tumor is following the, the, the trigeminal nerve. You're going to the Meckel case. We just need to follow the tumor from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa. It's the left side. It's the fourth nerve. This is the separated four. Here's the petrous. Here's the sig sigmoid size. In this situation, we're anterior and posterior to the sigmoid size posterior and anterior. You look the five now. This is the seven and eight is the lower cranial nerves. And the five will follow from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa, the Meckel's case. We open the Meckel's case. You can remove the anterior, the petrous apex by the posterior petrous approach, combining with the anterior petrous approach. See, in this situation, we follow the tumor from the posterior fossa to the middle fossa to the Meckel's case. If the tumor was going to the, the cavernous sign, you could follow it. See, because the posterior part of the cavernous sinus is wide, different than the anterior part of the superior artificial that is very, very close. In the post up, you have this pre up, post up, pre up, post up, pre up, post up, and the preservation of the ocular motor function. You know why? Because I just follow the anatomy, I just follow the tumor. To end, I want to say the surgery of the cavernous sinus is possible. For many in German, it's possible, but there is a limitation that it's a superior orbital fissure. Secondary evasion of the cavernous sinus makes the removal more feasible. It means if the tumor comes from outside to inside, you can follow the tumor. Asymptomatic tumor should be just observed and follow the ophthalmological exam. Don't need surgery. Don't need radio surgery. We don't advocate radio surgery for unproved, unproved tumor regrowth. Tumors start to grow again. If you have an MRI show, okay, the tumor is growing. You can go there and treat of radio surgery. I'm not giving in advance. Radiation, radiation is not like a, a food that you give there to, to eat. It's not this way, not this way. For pituitary, the surgery indication in my hand is if the patient has normal function, normal pituitary function, non-function tumor, with growth proof by MRI. Sometimes you do the surgery, remain a small piece of tumor inside the cavernous sinus. You don't need to give radiation. 
when they need to do the search again, just follow to see what's happened. Many times, uh, sometimes many, many, many years to grow very slow. A very small piece that you not change, change the behavior, not change the symptoms of the patient. But it, if the tumor is functioning as cushion disease, or the case of growth hormone that you cannot control of medication, or prolactin, prolactinoma that is not a response, is not responding to the medication, maybe we need surgery. Very important in skull base is judgment. Judgment, it means you know how to do, you see case by case. The extension of the removal depends on the each situation. The biggest trophy is the patient, not the tumor in your hand. As Professor just said, lab is everything. The lab in Tumini is wonderful. We have a lot of facilities. You should go there. The residents should go there and spend a lot of time there. When you spend life time, long time, in the lab, you learn a lot. Is the place to learn neurosurgery is in the lab, is not in the head of somebody. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Professor Sufiano, for the opportunity to talk again to you. Sorry for the problems with the communication. It is a great pleasure. In February, I'll, I'll be back to, to me. Thank you. Your microphone is off. Turn on, your, turn on your microphone. Okay. Okay. Now it's okay, yeah? Now it's okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Luis Borba, for your excellent presentation with a lot of, a lot of information. Uh, because this guy, by his own hand, uh, knows the problem. So why? Uh, the, this lecture, uh, this is very important. Because again, his, uh, his hand experienced neurosurgeons. It's very important. So why we must learn maybe not uh, one and see more and more and more. On the after repeat view in the lecture, maybe understand all ideas of Professor Luis Borba. For me, it's a great, great, great lessons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank again, you. Thank you. Yeah. I see your lectures again and again, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Yeah. And I also okay. hope to meet you again in Tumen in February or maybe early anytime because uh, a lot of projects only born uh, when we discuss together. Not internet is useful, but uh, um, communicate personally is most important. So I invite yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. all all people, all neurosurgical people who want to to to. To contribute in neurosurgery or we create new uh, project, come to Timin, come to our lab, and we develop new neurosurgery. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, again, I think to me, if the federal center, uh, the facility that you have there, few people in the world have, maybe nobody has. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the and the the environment is great. The people is friendly, the people love it. It's very, very important, very, very important yeah, to learn to see. I feel at home on thank you, thank you. We are one, Okay, my friend. Yeah. Okay, well, we are one neurosurgical family in the world. No problem, no problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, again, I want uh, to congratulate all participants on the lectures uh, with this seminar because uh, this is the first seminar from our series. And I hope this project will be great success. And, and uh, this project, uh, I hope, uh, uh, necessary, necessary for education, for the life of our, in our neurosurgical life. Uh, congratulations for all participants. Congratulations. And now I want to show again our schedule for the next, uh, for, for, for the year. Uh, Azamat Pakaji. Okay, and the, in this slide, it's possible to see our, 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 our schedule. So next seminar uh, will be 20th of November. The topic is uh, interventricular tumors, lateral, 
It's from uh, open surgery, endoscopic surgery view, and uh, uh, we will try to uh, include and invite uh, most uh, most interesting and most experienced expert in this fight of surgery. And I hope this seminar also will be very interesting, very interesting. So uh, we send information later about the uh, more detailed about this uh, process. Next will be acoustic neuroma in December and the Professor Mastranati's team is also prepared now and the uh, uh, fourth ventricle and brainstem tumors, spinal region anatomy and the tumors, craniosynostosis, the pediatric topics. It's for um, pediatric uh, neurosurgeon, but also interesting because approaches uh, for the like a transbasal approach is also very interesting. Also, very important topic because uh, results not uh, sometimes so so, so good. Craniopharyngioma tumors. Petra Clau is uh, uh, also very interesting because also difficult. Low grade gliomas, epilepsy is from functional and paracranial aneurysm. This is our schedule for the next year. Please take part. If uh, 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 if participants have any questions. Um, not he says to ask, ask, send for us to the email, and we try to, to answer for all uh, for, for all participants. Again, thank you very much, and uh, see all participants soon in November. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, bye -bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.